All right. Well, thanks again, Chris. That was really good. I, I totally agree. <laughs> I mean, the um, crypt, and you know, we don't see those cases a lot, but you know, the crypt, ovarectomy, OVH, remnant, pyo. I mean, those are all good cases. They're fairly straightforward. You know, great cases to build up your skills. If you have any concerns with anything, you know, I would just convert. I mean, we don't. I, I don't see a ton of like neoplastic. Um, crypto orchids most of them we do an abdominal ultrasound and they've just when they haven't upstaged at all uh, uh, but if you have you know any concerns you know i think the overarching theme here is that we need to do the surgery that we're going to do as good if not better than if we're going to do it open and so if there are you know metastatic lymph nodes or other abnormalities that you need to get a better look at i mean don't hesitate to open on, on any of these cases so along those lines, you know, gastropexy is also a, uh, you know, really common now. I think over the last 10 years, it's become super common. I think probably a lot more education to owners from breeders, a lot more owners getting on the internet about their breeds uh, that they're getting and, and wanting prophylactic gastropexy. The fact that we can do it laparoscopic and not open I mean, I think that's something that's really nice for owners to, uh, you know, it's an easier pill to swallow. And, uh, you know, again, it's a great procedure to hone your skills. I think, it, you know, starting with an assisted approach is, is fine, totally fine. And then progressing to doing intracorporeal suturing. I mean, that's a really nice progression. The intracorporeal suturing, as we'll talk about, it's definitely a steep learning curve. But once you traverse it, I think it, it ends up being a really nice procedure for you. It's, it's really fulfilling and, and also for, for the dog. These dogs do great. So let's start off with the assisted approach um, and really basic equipment here and, and same equipment that, you know, both Chris and I have been talking about, you know, basic stuff as far as, oh, sorry. Let's get the pointer working here. All right. Just basic stuff you need. Oh, sorry. Minor difficulties here. Okay. Yeah, basic stuff. You just need one six millimeter cannula that goes sub umbilical, classic uh, uh, location for your telescope, three degree telescope, zero degree, up to you. I pretty much use the 30 degree for everything, even single port, multi port, same as Chris. But, you know, for this procedure, does not make a difference. And then you need a second 12 millimeter cannula. And that is going to go at the location of your gastropexy. So in the right paramedian location. And that's so that you can insert a 10 millimeter grasping forcep. <coughs> Excuse me. You can do this with a single port. There's a technique. Uh, a good friend, Dr. Runge, has. Um, devised it's called the single port assisted gastropexy and ovarectomy and you can drop the sills port at the paramedian location do an ovarectomy and then do an assisted gastropexy as well um, but it is a bit more advanced and so if this is something you've never done before i'd stick with the standard uh you know assisted gastropexy and this was a technique uh designed or I guess created by Dr. Clarence Rawlings in the early 2000s, um, definitely a pioneer in veterinary MIS. And here are the port placements as he's described and as I mentioned, so sub-umbilical. So, you know, whatever entry technique you choose. So I, I do a modified Hassan, make a little uh, one centimeter skin incision. You know, as we were talking last week, I put two skin sutures, sorry, not skin sutures, stay sutures in the rectus fascia, elevate, drop in a six millimeter cannula, insufflate the abdomen, place my 12 millimeter port. And this is going to be, this has to be strategic. You don't just pop this in anywhere. This has got to be in the location of where your gastropexy is going to be. So, you know, note where your rectus abdominis muscle is. You want to be just lateral to that. And then you want to be, you know, roughly three, four centimeters caudal to the last rib. So you can see that externally when they're insufflated. And then you can also look at it, obviously, once you have your telescope in. 
So prepping these guys, you know, it's the same thing for the two port overectomy. You want to be a little bit wider on the right hand side. You probably don't need to go all the way down this low. It's not bad if you do, but uh, you need to go wider because your uh, paramedian port is going to, you know, be fairly lateral. And so you can't just drape the linea in and that's it. So just be aware of that. OR setup, once again, nothing fancy, similar to overectomy, similar to crypt. You know, the monitor can stay in front of you, off to towards the head. Again, just don't drape or don't connect your top drape to the back instrument table. Just gives you the opportunity to, to walk around as needed. Port placement, we talked about it um, just now, just review it again, and I've just drawn on the dog a little bit for teaching purposes. So this is the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, caudal abdomen, cranially abdomen. Here is the six millimeter cannula umbilicus, so we're in a sub-umbilical location. This is the last rib. You can't really tell in this picture, but this is a um, giant breed dog and the abdomen is insufflated. So, you know, this is exactly where you want to be, just lateral to your rectus abdominis. And then, you know, this is three, four centimeters caudal to your last rib. You obviously don't want to be anywhere near that last rib because that's where the diaphragm is inserting. Another view, that's with that 10 millimeter, 12 millimeter port in place. And it's a pretty quick laparoscopy, obviously, if you're doing the assisted approach. You know, you insufflate, you have a look around, you choose where your 12 millimeter port goes in. And then now we've inserted our 10 millimeter Babcocks and we grasp the stomach. And that's it for the laparoscopy. Excuse me. Now, this is that other option that I was talking about. This is the technique by um, Jeff Runge, the Spago single port assisted gastropexine overectomy. So this is that same location I'm talking about. And it's a little bit harder with this technique because you don't have, you know, your telescope going in initially to determine exactly where this is going to go, but it's not too bad. I mean, you can palpate the last rib. You have a pretty good idea where rectus abdominis is, and then you just make your two and a half centimeter approach and drop your sills in through this paramedian incision. You can do an overectomy because like I said, you know, the, you guys are probably already seeing cases like this. Uh, but if you are going to ramp up your MIS cases, you know, the, the classic spay pexy is, is going to be a weekly uh, uh, case. And so, you know, this is another way to develop a, an additional assisted gastropexy technique. It is a little bit more challenging because to do the overectomy from a paramedian approach it can be a bit challenging and, uh, you know, definitely, I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but definitely read the paper by uh, Dr. Runge. He does talk about some uh, alterations that you need to make as far as uh, the overectomy goes. Okay, so like I said, it's a very short laparoscopy when you have your 12 millimeter ports in your, you know, strategic spot. You've got your 10 millimeter graspers dropped in, very quick laparoscopy. You are basically looking for, so here's the stomach obviously, here is the pylorus, and then pyloric antrum, all right? And this is exactly where we're going to do our gastropexy if it was an open, if it was GDV, right? And so where this star is, that's where you're going to grasp. And so, uh, it's approximately, you know, going to be the most ORAD location of your gastropexy, but it doesn't have to be. So once you, you just want to be in this pyloric antral region. And then once you grasp the antrum, as we've done in this picture, then, you know, the insufflation can be purged. You can open up the valves, stop your insufflation, and your laparoscopy is essentially over. There's a quick video of the actual grasping. So we're put in our 12 millimeter port, 10 millimeter graspers inserted. And, you know, we've confirmed this is our stomach. We confirm that with the vasculature. 
You can take your camera over, make sure you see the pylorus. And that's it. This is the whole procedure as far as the laparoscopic portion. So then at this point, you know, the CO2 has been purged from the abdomen and we've enlarged that instrument portal about three centimeters. As soon as I, you know, once I grasp the stomach from that last video, I try not to change the orientation because you know you don't want to twist the stomach at all. As soon as the stomach comes out, we put a stay suture on the ORAD location and then a stay suture on the ab ORAD location. And then it's just like an incisional gastropexy. You know, you feel for the slip in the seromuscular layer and you incise that seromuscular layer and create a seromuscular flap, leaving the submucosa and mucosa intact. And then this is the start of the gastropexy where we're suturing the transversus abdominis to that seromuscular layer exactly as you would open. So nothing fancy at all. You know, I suture that cranial, those two cranial incisions, the caudal incisions. You know, I have a lot of sutures going because I want to make sure I know what layer is transversus abdominis. And I also tag, not seen in this picture, but I also tag the external and internal abdominal oblique because I want to be absolutely meticulous in closing because this is, this is a seroma prone area and procedure. So you can kind of see the schematic. Yeah, sure. I generally just do the cranial incisions, tie at the apex here, and then continue, just cut the loop, and then continue back down. And that's what we've done here. You can kind of see the submucosa and mucosa pooching through. What's nice about the assisted technique is that once you've done that, you know, once you've you've sutured just the transversus abdominis to the seromuscular layer, you've created a seal in the abdomen and you can re-insufflate. I mean, I generally, you know, I haven't done this in a while, but when I was doing these assisted um, pexies, I would go back in at six millimeters of mercury uh, just so I don't over distend the abdomen or the, the gastropexy and then just make sure my orientation was correct. Uh, full disclosure, I recall we, we did a paper with these. I had one or two cases where I had took these sutures down because I had the stomach in an improper orientation. So it, it is a thing. It can happen. So it is nice to verify the uh, gastropexy orientation. And there is the closure. Now, do not take this closure lightly at all. If you are going to be doing assisted gastropexies, you are in for wound complications of this site. Try your very best to be as meticulous as you can with closure of your internal abdominal obliques. There's another layer of external abdominal oblique fascia and then sub-Q and skin. And you can block this area with uh, local anesthetic. These guys, they are, they are a little bit sore here, and it makes sense. I mean, you're cutting through three layers of muscle, and this is seroma central. And be aware of that. You can warn owners there's about a 30% risk of wound complications. So, you know, I think along those lines, we were, we were interested to see, you know, at least in, in my case, what the um, complications were. We looked at about 50 dogs, all had about a uh, greater than a year follow-up. And uh, you know, none of these dogs had a GDD, which is great. Obviously, no surprise there. It it's obviously provides a very, very robust gastropexy. Uh, but all owners, you know, this is super biased, but you know, we, we did ask, we just surveyed the owners. They were all satisfied. They'd do the surgery again. Uh, of course, if they paid money for it, they're going to they're biased towards that. Um, but, you know, 30% wound complication, most of them were minor. There were two cases that needed our second surgery. And this sort of, I mean, this is, this is not anything new with the assisted gastropexy procedure. You know, there is, there can be some wound complications, like I said, with that paramedian incision. 
be meticulous with your closure. I cannot stress that enough. I would tag each layer with suture so that you are not, it's, you know, for those of you who have done it, you know what I mean. It can be confusing and it happens all the time where the external oblique gets close to the internal oblique layer. And so don't let that happen to you. Be meticulous if this is a surgery that you're going to be doing and do your very best to minimize wound complications because it just rots me when, uh, you know, we're doing an elective procedure and, uh, you know, complications happen. So I think this, the fact that there was wound complications and the fact that, you know, we're just, you know, wanting to push the envelope, uh, you know, we, we came up with the, um, a variation on doing a total laparoscopic gastropexy and that involves intracorporeal suturing and what that the way that that technique works so well is that or one of the reasons is that all the ports are on midline and i'm like i really try hard any procedure that i'm doing i try to put all my ports on midline of course sometimes it doesn't work you know for adrenal cholecystectomy you're, you have some ports in the paramedian location but i really try my best to have all ports on midline because you know it's you're right on linea and you know it's unlikely there's going to be wound complications with that i think the other really cool thing with doing intracorporeal suturing is that you get needle drivers in your hand and doing you know intracorporeal suturing is it's difficult like i said a steeper learning curve but it's a lot of fun really fulfilling and one thing that makes intracorporeal suturing much easier is barbed suture and uh, some of you may have heard of that for those of you that haven't, here are a couple examples of barb suture. This is one of the Ethicon products. And you can see these unidirectional barbs that are cut uh, uh, into the suture. And it's kind of, the theory is kind of like a porcupine quill where it's unidirectional and you, it, it can't get pulled out. This is the Covidian Medtronic product. It's called V-Lock. And the way that these sutures work is that they are anchored you can see that ethicon products got a tab that's uh um, set in this suture versus the v-lock product has this welded loop and you have to feed the needle of the uh suture through that welded loop initially to lock the suture and then you're good to go and you do not need to tie knots and so very very helpful for endoscopic suturing not tying i mean it can be done it's uh it is much more time consuming and so barbed sutures uh really make your life easy when you're doing intracorporeal suturing for a gastropexy so admittedly you know when we first started doing or started using barbed suture i was a bit and you know you know surgeons they're just change is is difficult uh, but this study was great by dr monet's group it was ex vivo gastropexy model and the bottom line was they tested not less than traditional 2o and 3o suture and put them in a, a mechanical testing machine pulled apart the gastropexy and looked at load to failure and believe it or not the not less 2o was stronger than traditional 2o and 3o so this was great it, even though it was a cadaveric study i mean it's essentially like a an acute gastropexy and so it was very good to know that not the suture was at least equivalent and actually stronger than uh you know to the the standard not tied 2o suture so really good study i think that was very helpful for us as we were sort of uh you know switching towards total lap laparoscopic gastropexy. So let's get into that technique. What is some of the key instrumentation? Uh, 30 degree scope, I think is important for the, the total lap, just so that you get a better, um, you can look around some corners that way. For most cases I'm doing, a, you know, these are gonna be a spay gastropexy. And even if it is a male dog and a giant breed, I still will likely put in a sills port as the most caudal port. And I'll, I'll talk to you why. You can certainly do this with three um, 
uh, five millimeters or at least two five millimeters and a 12, you need the 12 to feed in the stratafix, at least the way I do that. The other uh, uh, key pieces is a J-hook monopolar electrosurgery probe. This is a picture of the J-hook. <clears throat> really great tool for fine dissection uh, for you know adrenal, gallbladder, kidney, uh, but really important too for this gastropexy. And I'll, I'll show you uh, some videos, obviously, of where we use this instrument. You need some needle holders, endoscopic specific, obviously. I have a, I'll talk about those in a second. Some Babcock forceps, some scissors, suction if you got it, not essential. So needle drivers, really, really important. You know, you want to get a robust pair of needle drivers. Uh, and, and again, you know, I think trying to practice holding the needle, throwing some bites, tying some knots in a box trainer prior to getting into a clinical case is of the utmost importance. It is, it has a steep learning curve, but once you traverse it, it's a great skill to have. Here are a couple options for needle holders. So this is a pistol grip, and this is just a straight grip. I would definitely recommend the straight grip. <clears throat> I've tried the pistol grip, but, and I just, it's, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, so I would say the straight grip for sure. I don't know. We'll see what Chris says after. Setup, nothing fancy. I would clip, prep, and drape as you would for uh, an open gastropexy or for an open laparotomy. You know, maybe clip a little bit wider down the right side, just like you would for an assisted technique. All right, so here's port placement. <clears throat> and as I'm gonna, going to go through the video, port placement is critical for this, at least for me. So this is that first port. You know, again, I have a male in the picture, obviously, but you know, I'm gonna, if it's a female, I'll put a sills port in here and maybe even more caudal to do the overectomy. In giant breeds, this is going to be the second and third ports. In giant breeds, and that's where the needle drivers go in. So I'm going to be standing here, assistant back here, who's going to, who's going to hold or take over camera. These two ports are really important. And, you know, you do, you know, this port has to be much more than just sub-umbilical. It's got to be a couple centimeters, even more caudal whether it's with a sills, six or, or 10 cannula. And that's because in a lot of giant breeds that this second port for your assistant needle driver, because if you're right-handed actually, or if you're left-handed, this is going to be your dominant hand. And so where this initial dominant hand needle driver needs to go is absolutely parallel to where your gastropexy is going to be. And so if you leave three to five centimeters between these, this middle port with the assistant or non-dominant hand needle driver, it's going to be right around just cranial to the umbilicus in most giant breeds. So you need to, what I do, and I'll show you this, is I just, I find my gastropexy spot and I put a zero PDS needle through the transcutaneous, transabdominal, and just park it there. And then I will go parallel and place this port. And so in between the initial telescope or sills port and this port, I'll have the assistant needle driver port. And that, like I said, it generally ends up being just cranial to the umbilicus. If you have, so what are problems? And, learn, and you know, this is certainly something I learned. I would place all three ports before even, you know, having any idea where the gastropexy is going to be. I would have the assistant port here, probably that cranial port up here. And it is impossible to suture that. I ended up adding, you know, trying to, being stubborn and trying to fight through that is such a frustrating process because you just don't have that much freedom of movement 
and you need your needle driver to be parallel to your gastropexy incisions. So certainly this is, this is the biggest tip I can tell you is that port placement is essential. And <clears throat> if you're not happy with the ports, don't waste any time. These ports are on linea. Just pull that awkward port out, suture it up, place another port in a few centimeters away. It can make all the difference, especially when you're just learning to suture. So this is exactly what I was talking about. So we're in here, we've just put a telescope port in. I've placed a zero PDS needle. This is where my gastropexy is going to be. Here's the diaphragm. You can kind of see the fat last rib. Right, same exact location as it would be if we were doing it open or assisted. Just park the needle there. That gives you a, a location of where your pexy is going to be. And then you can subsequently place your most cranial port. Next thing that's really important is don't do this. You want to have your ports. So this is going to be a five, six millimeter cannula. You know, these are all giant breeds. They've got giant falciforms. You know, you don't want this to happen. Super annoying when your cannula port goes right in the middle of the falciform. <clears throat> what you need to do is just be a touch off. You know, if you can be a centimeter off of midline, something like that. So then you avoid this drape of falciform. Okay, so that's your most cranial port. You're parallel to where you parked that zero PDS needle. Then you can sort of split the difference between your telescope and your most cranial port with your <clears throat> second instrument port, which is going to have your non-dominant hand needle driver. I like these threaded ports for the for most laparoscopy. So if you have those, it's great. Definitely resists pull out. All right. So then the next step is is that that zero PDS needle that you parked, you're going to put a stay suture at the level of your gastropexy. I'm just verifying here. Okay, here's proximal duodenum. There was pylorus. So we've got that parked zero PDS needle. I'm going to take that needle out. You always want to be sure of orientation of your needle. And I did mention this. So I had a, um, an awesome resident recently. She's left-handed. She just, based on the orientation and where the ports go in and everything, she learned this with her non-dominant hand being her, um, her right hand. But, you know, she's, she was so good. She was pretty much ambidextrous. And so if you're left-handed, you know, unfortunately, you're going to have to get your right hand to have that dominant needle driver. Just rewind that. Sorry, I was, <clears throat> I was talking. So this is the same location that you would use, again, where you may grasp if you were doing this assisted or where you'd grab if you were doing this open, pyloric antrum. It might air a little bit more towards the fundus, but not much. And then I take that zero PDS needle, drop, drop it out through the body wall again. And then this is now a stay suture. And I externally, I will put a hemostat right to the skin so that this stay suture is very tight. And <clears throat> this is going to be the location. This is going to be the location of the gastropexy. So it's just, you know, the, the stay suture is essentially presenting that to you. If you're not happy with that, you know, I, I, I like this. I'm in an area avascular area or, or roughly avascular, greater curvature, lesser curvature in here. If you're not happy, just pull the stay suture out and, and try it again. No big deal at all. All right. So here is, um, you know, a little bit of an evolution of my techniques. I started, we started with uh, just taking a single strand of V-lock suture and essentially just cauterizing the stomach, the seromuscular layer, and then the body wall and suturing them together with a single layer of V-lock. And um, this was a, a paper that was done by Jeff Runge and Joel Takis. And this was um, published in 2016. There was a lot of dogs in this study with that, you know, we didn't even make an incision really. It was just a scarification with the cautery 
you know, not a bad surgery time. There was one dog that had a GDV in that study. There wasn't any major complications. Uh, you know, we, this was actually, um, sadly, this was one of my cases. It was a great Dane that died of DCM. And I went down to the bathroom and, uh, just wanted to see what the gastropexy looked like. And this was with that single strand. So, you know, it had taken in this dog. Uh, and, and so this is, this is a technique that, that seemingly worked well. But we evolved from that. I've, I've switched now to uh, doing a full, you know, exactly what we do in an open surgery. So full thickness incision through transversus abdominis, full seromuscular incision. And then I've started to use two strands of the Ethicon suture, the Stratifix. So let me show you my technique. And, you know, obviously would you know, love to hear what Chris does and if he has any modification. So this is where the J-hook is awesome. So I'm trying to stay parallel to the transversus abdominis muscle fibers. I want to see the fascia of the external abdominal oblique. And there you go. So then I know I'm full thickness. And I know I, the, the distance from this tip of the electrosurgery probe to that Covidian logo is a centimeter. And I'm, you know, based on that recent paper by um, Dr. Monet, Dr. Webb, uh, it's, you know, we need to get at least three centimeter gastropexy with two strands, and it's going to be a, a very strong, robust gastropexy. So I'm going to mark that out. And I think this is like very little morbidity personally, because you're, you're, you essentially just split the transversus abdominis muscle fibers. You're not cutting in this orientation. I know many people do, and, and that's fine. Um, but I, I like this way. This is exactly how I do it open as well. All right, so now, you know, same thing. I want to create a good seromuscular flap, just like I would open. And so I take some Babcocks <clears throat> and grab the stomach, and then I, I just mark where I'm going to incise with this J-hook. You can actually kind of see in this dog, the this, this submucosa has already fallen down. You know, you can see a nice seromuscular layer over. So you get the picture there. Yeah. So if you were to, you know, palpate this with your fingers, you would feel that slip here. So, you know, you don't always see this, but in this case, at least, you know, you, you have a feeling that uh, a good feeling that you're far away because that's one thing you lose the haptic feedback. And, you know, I have these, uh, you know, short tip scissors so that I know I, it's going to be very unlikely that I'm going to penetrate the, uh, you know, gastric lumen. So what I'm doing now is just incising that uh, kind of marked area with the J-hook electrosurgery probe. And, uh, you know, again, doing a little bit of dissection. I want to get a nice flap, exactly what you would open. So nothing fancy here. If you do open gastropexies, it's the exact same uh, technique. Obviously, you lose the haptic feedback. And so, you know, you do... This is nice. You don't always see the submucosa. So just be careful at this point. And you can, you know, if you're ever worried, you can also just put in your uh, Kelly or Marilyn forceps as you're dissecting and, and look for that submucosa layer. So this is now, you know, introducing the barbed suture into the abdomen. Now, this was the, back in the days when I was using um, V lock. And you can just, that's the nice thing about V lock. You can just pop it in percutaneously. <laughs> I really try not to handle the suture with my needle drivers. I, I don't want to grab it. Uh, I'm just using indirect methods to pull that suture in. I really don't want to, uh, you know, uh, by grabbing it, I don't, I don't want to ruin it in, in any way or compromise it. That's the word I was looking for, the suture. And uh, that's, that's putting the V-lock in. The stratifix, the tab on the end of it, it prevents percutaneous introduction and you have to pass it through a 12 millimeter port. And so I'll show you that in a second. The other big thing is when you're passing it through, you know, I'll just show it again. You know, this needle is getting passed in this direction purposely. It's not a fluke. You know, we want to maintain this orientation because this is how we're going to be suturing and trying to manipulate and change the orientation of the needle 
huge, huge challenge. And it's, it's can be a real, really, uh, large time suck in trying to, uh, reorient the needle. And so really do your best to maintain needle orientation. So Alex Alvarez, uh, from, from UF and, and, um, Dr. Bailey did this really cool little study where they percutaneously introduced suture. I admittedly had that welded loop on VLOC uh, break uh, a couple of times passing it through. Not a lot. I've used that suture a, a lot. And so it's been pretty good, uh, but I have had it break occasionally. So they did a, they, they, you know, objectively quantified this. They passed VLOC. They passed another barb suture called Quill and no mage. And then, biomechanically tested the suture. So the VLOC and the Quill Monoderm were pretty good, but the, the Quill PDS actually was not good. So just be aware of that and be aware of this paper if that's something that you are, if that's the suture that you're using. So this is the uh, Stratifix suture. So this is kind of, this is exactly what I do to um, put this in. I take the needle driver out. You have to take the cap off the port, whatever port you're using, preload that on your needle driver, wrap the, it is kind of, um, it's a little bit annoying, but it's totally fine. Uh, and then because you just don't want to minimize your loss of pneumoperitoneum because once your needle driver goes in, you know, the valve is, is open and so you'll lose pneumo. But, you know, if you preload the cap and you just push the Stratifix in, it's fairly straightforward. I switch the camera to one of those cranial ports and then drop in a, a needle driver and, and then grab it and then bring this needle driver back into one of the cranial ports. So it's fairly uh, straightforward. I'm sure there's other methods for getting the Stratifix into the abdomen, but this, this method seems to work well for me. All right, so then <clears throat> now, you know, the actual suturing, uh, you know, you initially, just like you would, in an open gastropexy, you're going to suture these cranial incisions first. And uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, these, this is a skill you ideally want to build up in a, uh, you know, a stress-free environment. So like a, a lab, you know, your home in a box trainer, if you can. And, uh, you know, then these skills, even in a, you know, low fidelity model, they're really transferable. And so when it comes time to suturing, you know, for sure, it's, there's a learning curve, but um, you'll just be that much better. So you just saw with the Stratifix, I really, I'm trying to indirectly tighten the suture. And I saw that the tab was affixed against the stomach wall. And so that I know I'm seated. And then nothing fancy here. You know, I've got a, a nice flap in the stomach. <laughs> I suture that cranial incision. And then you do, I generally do do a little mattress at the end because that is recommended by the manufacturer to do what's called a back stitch, just to actually lock the suture. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll just cut the suture and either bring it out through the port or pass the um, suture through the body wall. So I've just cut it there and I just pass it transcutaneously. So it's a cranial incision and then same thing with the caudal, nothing fancy. Let's fast forward it a little bit. Seems to be, uh, you know, there's generally less bites in that those caudal incisions. And, you know, you really need to prioritize, you know, maintaining this needle orientation. And if you can do that, then uh, it will really reduce your surgery time. Because for those that have tried this, you know, if you lose your needle orientation, it just takes so it takes minutes to reorient the needle again it's it's tough and it just increases frustration um, so if you can do that then that's great so there's there's our gastropexy completed at this point in time i'll purge the pneumo 
open up the valves, get the gas out. And I just generally just watch the gastropexy. You know, as you can imagine, this is the time that the gastropexy is going to be at its greatest tension with the dog lying on its back and, uh, you know, a higher, much greater intra-abdominal pressure. And you can switch your camera just to look at the cranial aspect. So I do want to mention just quickly the endo stitch. This is a, a, a technique that's reported. This is what's called a suture assist device the endo stitch. And um, this is a video of, uh, I've never done one of these techniques, but it's a video from um, Dr. Milovansev at Oregon State University. Really, really good surgeon there. And um, he's, he's done a really nice job with this um, gastropexy. You can see the welded loop on the V-lock. It's the same thing. Um, this is endo stitch specific V-lock that comes preloaded in this device. And so, yeah, this is another method that's been reported. There are some publications on this technique. So certainly if, if you, uh, your practice has an uh, endo stitch and you're interested in this technique, uh, that's great. Um, there's certainly some info out there to help you. Um, I personally like using the needle drivers. I think it, it develops other you know, skills of where you may need to use intracorporeal suturing. Uh, and so I like that having the needle drivers, but this is, this is a great technique as well and has been shown to be very efficacious. So what are some complications? I mean, um, you know, I think the biggest thing on here is just the learning curve that you need to traverse to suture. Um, other things, you know, if you're using the V-lock, I've had the welded loop break and you just have to pull it out and start again. Um, I've had the suture break and same thing. You just have to bring in another... Um, piece of suture. The one thing I've noticed with the Stratifix, I've been using the Stratifix now for about two years, and um, I do find the needle is a little less robust than the V-Lock, but it's still, I, I still really like it. Uh, and then, you know, intragastric suture penetration. I don't know, I've not seen, I've not had a problem. I think, again, if you can create a nice seromuscular flap, that shouldn't be an issue. So I think some, some key things Port placement, super important. You really need to have your cranial needle driver that has to be parallel with the location of your gastropexy. If you stray, it's going to be a challenge to suture. Get a really good pair of needle holders, needle drivers, and practice as much as you can, you know, in, in a box trainer, uh, you know, even just on a piece of foam, some sort of suture pad it will be really helpful and those skills definitely um, traverse to clinical cases. So very happy to uh, <clears throat> take some questions. That was awesome. Thanks so much, Meet. Um, we do have a couple questions already. Um, so starting for the lap-assisted vaccine, when you're making your paramedian approach, do you separate along the muscle fibers? Um, and then also realize that tacking layers may increase discomfort with the incision, but is it ever attempted to reduce the incidence of seroma formation? Yeah, great question. So if you can, if you can split fibers, go for it. I definitely try, again, admittedly, I haven't done that procedure in probably five years. Um, just because of the switch to intracorporeal, but I definitely tried to do a grid approach. Um, not not sure about you, Chris, when you when or if you've done that or what you were doing. And I would try to tack to try to limit seroma formation for sure. Yeah, I would agree. We uh, similarly, I think we only did them for probably a year during my residency, and I haven't done one since. Um, switched to total. Um, intracorporeal and haven't gone back but when we did the lap assisted um, definitely try to split the, the muscle fibers and similarly you do have to go through at least two to three layers of um, muscle so you ended up again making that growth approach. Uh, next question do you have a preference for intracorporeal suture meaning VLOC versus the Ethicon? Uh, yeah, I, I used VLOC a ton. Uh, I definitely started off learning with VLOC. I've switched to Stratifix. I think I've been using that for about two years now. I just find it a, a bit more robust, personally. 
Um, I, I don't know about you, Chris. Yeah, so I've only used the V-Lock. Um, I will say that similar to you, I've had a handful of cases where the uh, pre-tied loop has failed as they're passing it through the body wall. And so um, I would say that that's a huge reason to emphasize that it's important to learn how to tie an intracorial knot, just because if you do have that happen, you don't want to um, be stuck without a solution. And so um, I've only used a V-lock. I can't comment on the Stratafix. I think that it looks um, like an interesting option and seems to be very um, efficient. So I think I'd be happy to use it, but um, definitely if you're going to consider the V-lock, it's important to be comfortable with the intracorporeal suturing and not tying just because that definitely has happened and, and you need that save if you're going to use it. The one thing, excuse me, the one thing I, I didn't mention is if you're going to get, you know, either the V-lock or the Stratifix, the one thing I like about the Stratifix, total tangent, but the barbs are, are right up to the tab. The one thing with the V-lock is the barbs, have you noticed that too, Chris? Yeah. The barbs are, are about a centimeter away from the loop. And so your first few bites, they're not, it's not engaging anything. I didn't love that. Uh, you know, the, the other thing, the big thing though, uh, oh yeah, what I was trying to say here is that you want to get the shortest strand of suture possible. And that's six inches. Don't, you know, don't order the 15 incher because then you'll have suture, you know, like flying around the abdomen. It'll be really tough to get it going. Yeah, I agree. And when I uh, train people, when I do it, I definitely um, emphasize that you have to take at least two good bites before you actually tighten the V-lock just because the, that end suture is not going to be able to actually cinch down. And so to get a good seal there, you have to take a couple bites before you truly make that um, end tight. Yeah. Um, other questions. So, um, may use paper comparing lap assisted versus total lap gastropexy mentioned that they switched the orientation of their incision to be parallel to the ventral midline, uh, meaning not the actual muscle fibers to help with visualization of both edges. Um, the commenter feels like most surgeons do the incision perpendicular. So similar to what you did in the video, do either of you have experience with parallel incisions and would it affect your port placement? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I just, uh, you know, I try to just do the same thing I would do open. Uh, I know some surgeons do it um, parallel to midline open. I think that's probably fine. I think too, the way that I orient the incision on the transversus, like I said, it's just like splitting the fibers of the transversus versus like cutting them. If you're going, uh, parallel to midline probably has minimal consequences. There is, if you, um, if you look up some of, uh, actually Kristen Coleman and Eric Monet have a couple of papers out on an endo stitch, uh, gastropexy and they have a port description of where to put them and if you're, uh, if you're going to orient your gastropexy uh, or the incision in the transversus parallel to, to midline. So all of their ports, uh, I don't think all of them are on ventral midline. They've got at least one and then they've triangulated around in the right paramedian uh, location. Yeah, I agree. And uh, again, now I'm, I'm just doing the total intracorporeal. Um, so going perpendicular to midline is generally the uh, most efficient way and kind of easiest way for me. So I'm not, again, I haven't done a lap assist for a while, so I can't really comment much on, on adjusting the actual incision line. Good. Any other questions for gas or That was a really awesome presentation. Um, you mentioned needle bending as a complication while improving intracorporeal skills. Do you have tricks to salvage this? Or if you can't safely bend it back, do you just cut off that needle and start a new line? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, full disclosure, if I see that the needle is, is bent slightly with a couple of bites to go, I power through. Uh, is that, is that wrong? Probably, but, uh, you know, it, it gets done. Uh, I think I've never had the case where it's been so bent that I can't, uh, 
you know, take a bite. Uh, I'm not sure about you, Chris, but I do find, you know, I've used a lot of VLOC. I've, you know, probably starting to use a bunch of, you know, I've had a bit more experience with Stratifix now. I just find that the the needle with VLOC is a bit more robust than the Stratifix, but um, it's not, I, I'm going to stick with the Stratifix. It's not going to make me revert back. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that um, if it's just a, a small bend, then most of the time it doesn't actually affect things too much. I have had one case um, that I can remember where um, I had a, a different person, essentially a, a, a trainee that was doing the tutorial suturing and grabs the tip of the needle with the um, needle drivers and bent the, the tip 90 degrees. And so in that situation, we did have to cut it there and ended up putting in a second strand. but. Um, otherwise, I feel like you can usually adapt to it. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I've had lots of things. I mean, pretty much anything that could have gone wrong with this, I've had go wrong. But, um, you know, if you're in the middle of your line, the needle bends to 90 degrees, the suture breaks. I mean, you, you can just cut your suture and then put in another V-lock or Stratifex and carry on. You know, you can, uh, you know, use... Obviously, it's not ideal, but you can just use an, a, an additional suture strain. I mean, I will say, um, you know, these these sutures are expensive. The VLOC and the Stratifix. You know, the, the PDS is obviously expensive in the monofilament world, but these are like ten times the cost of a pack of PDS. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, another good question from Paulina um, asked, have you ever performed a laparoscopic left-sided gastropexy as part of facial hernia treatment? Yeah, great question. I mean, that that's, um, I, I think we should probably have a, a hernia webinar problem. Yeah. I'm sure, Chris, you have that up your sleeve, huh? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting area for uh, laparoscopic treatment. Obviously, you know, GERD, like, gastroesophageal reflux disease is a huge thing in people and, and laparoscopic hiatal is a big thing of that. Uh, <clears throat> long story short, uh, you can do a left-sided as part of a hiatal. You can do a right-sided as part of a hiatal hernia um, But, you know, that's going to be combined like the classic triple uh, therapy, which is, um, you know, tightening the esophageal hiatus doing a, so phrenoplasty, doing an esophagopexy, and then doing a gastropexy. So um, uh, Dr. Mayhew and, and Monet, they both have some publications that are coming out shortly for um, lap hiatal and some really great data there. And, and they've definitely done um, gastropexy as part of uh, the, the therapy. Awesome. Um, any other questions before we end for this session? All right, don't see any immediately. I am just, again, kind of repeating what we've already talked about, but we will be, I'll be editing the video. I'll send it out to everyone that registered. So you will have this available if you want to rewatch any of the videos or um, positioning, anything like that. Um, again, really have to emphasize, uh, would recommend joining VES if you are at all interested in this kind of, um, learning opportunities. Um, it's been a great society, um, and it continues to grow daily. So, um, I will send a link on how to join, um, for VES and then, um, question from Samantha, but um, there is a link for Journal Club tomorrow. It's been sent to the VES membership. Um, I can send it out to everyone that registered for this as well if you'd like to join. Um, it's 7 o'clock tomorrow morning Pacific time, so um, I will send that link out later tonight. Awesome. Uh, no other questions. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and uh, again, hope to see you at future events as well. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully see you in November for the uh, Advanced Lab series. Yeah. Awesome. Have a good night.